Welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It's nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And this is the moment that I've been waiting for since I started this channel. Um, you know, the, the, my personal hero, somebody who has influenced my career massively, in my opinion, the best magician in the world. I am so super glad that he found time to come on the channel. I am, of course, talking about the one and only John Bannon. How are you doing, John? I'm good. Thanks, Greg. I'm, I'm happy to be here, especially after that introduction. Are you kidding? It's true. You know, I, I had a bucket list of people that I wanted to interview on this channel. And, and I've spoken so much about you on it. People keep saying to me, when are you interviewing John Bannon? When are you interviewing John Bannon? So I'm so excited that that moment has finally arrived. So thanks for finding time to do this. I really appreciate it. I really do. Happy um, to be here. You know what? There's a lot I want to talk to you about. Okay. And you've done so much through your career and you're responsible for so much magic. Like, I have no idea. You must have forgotten more tricks than I know. Like, I mean, the amount of content and the amount of stuff that you've published throughout the years, it's, it's crazy. The amount of influences that you've had on genres and on, on everything. I want, to talk about, I want to talk about the whole thing, if I can. <laughs> uh, there's so much to talk about. There really is. All right. But I want to start at the very beginning. Okay. Um, and I want to talk about your origin story, first of all, if we can, John. Um, how did you get into magic? What, what was that moment? Where did, where did that all come from? Origin story is pretty typical. I had a buddy of mine, uh, this was when I was in high school, like back in the 70s. Went to like Disneyland, Disney World and came back with a book on card tricks. And we both started fooling around with that and it stuck with me and it didn't stick with him and that's how it all got started and then I mean you know, I don't know what it, it's the typical thing back then was you go get the Bruce Elliott books out of the library right you join the local magic club and we had I was in Norfolk Virginia at the time and we had a great magic club there I mean there was there was really some really amazing people that really helped me out a lot so um that's where I got started. And that was a long time ago. And, you know, I've, I've interviewed people on the channel that they kind of get interested in magic, but then they kind of drop away from it and then come back to it. Did you, when you, did, did that happen to you or were you just like, you, you, you found this whole thing, this whole world opened up and you just became obsessed? Where, where did that, that? Yeah, I, uh, I've pretty much, once since I started, been doing it been, been interested in it continuously there was maybe a period of time where you know like when I was in college or, or when I was first starting out um, that I didn't spend as much time on it but it was still always there it's all and then and then when I had the opportunity it picked back up again you know and, and then the big change you know when you first start out and you're young you try you try to do everything right you do uh Cards, coins, ropes, you know, cups and balls, that kind of stuff, which I did, and I and I and which I appreciate and enjoy. But when I first started practicing law, I had no time, no time at all. So I just kind of made the conscious decision to just do card tricks. I mean, that was my my first love. It's my main obsession, and just simplifies things to uh, just. You know, it's a simplifying assumption, just do card tricks. And that's kind of where I am right now, you know. Yeah. And I want to talk about that creativity side of things in a minute. But before I do, you talked about practicing law there. For people that don't know, you've never been a professional entertainer. You went into, which is, 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 that, is that fair to say? That's absolutely, I mean, there was a time when I was doing like table magic at a bar in D.C., but that's never been a main thing for me. And which means no one should listen to a word I have to say since I'm not a professional. Now, I've used you as an example <laughs> several times on this channel. I'd love you to talk about this because I think that you become more creative when you don't have to rely on magic for money. When, when you become a professional magician, there's certain sacrifices you have to make. There's certain tricks that you might love to perform but you know that they're not going to work in the environment that you're paid to gig. So you end up doing the ambitious card and sponge balls for the millionth time. I think that when you don't have to rely on magic for a pace for a paycheck, 
you can become more creative and you've got more freedom to find out who you are as a as a magician and a creator i, I think you're absolutely right i would hate to have to be that kind of a professional where you do the same trick same six tricks over and over and over again nothing against that i mean good for good for these people who want to make their living that way it just never interested me you know and uh I, and I was joking when I said people should not pay any attention to anything I say, uh, although there is an attitude like that out there, as you know, um, but I think it's a little short sighted. I mean, I have done enough magic. So if I invent a trick, I know that it's going to be a good trick, right? You know, I, I will test drive it, you know, a number of times and I'll just know it's good. Now, is it 100% polished at that point? No. Okay, does it work? Is it worth polishing? Absolutely. And so I have my own judgment on that. And, and you know, you can agree or disagree, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. It's like, yeah, I'm not a professional. I haven't, I haven't performed this in front of live people a thousand times, but so what? You know, people out there should have their own, they should have their own ideas of what's good and what's not. And so they can look at my stuff and decide for themselves whether it's something they want to do. You know, um, I don't know. This is kind of a pet peeve with me, but so I, I will try not to rant too much about it. I've seen it on Facebook forums. I've seen it where um, professional magicians will will talk down to people that are just amateurs because, you know, they, they, they think that they don't know what they're talking about and you can't have an opinion on something unless you're out doing it in the trenches, so to speak. And uh yeah, which is so totally wrong, if you ask, in my opinion. But, you know, people are entitled to their own opinions. What I, I, uh, I have come to the point where I do not go on uh, Magic Cafe or Facebook or I don't read the reviews of any of my stuff that comes out because there's just too many people out there who don't get it for one reason or another. And that's fine if they don't get it. But if you don't get it, you don't need to be talking about it. You know, it's like, give me a break. You know, like I remember one time I looked up, some guy had some particular criticism about my performance or something like that. And so I looked this guy up, he, you know, he had his website there and I, and I clicked on it and he was some clown, literally a clown that puts on clown makeup and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm going, you don't have any right to tell me about my performing style, pal. So Anyway, that's, that's another rant. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely fine. But so. I find it, yeah, I find it very interesting that you said, uh, you know, you went to practice law, you started off focusing on card magic because obviously you were so busy. You made the decision not to go full time, which is fantastic. Right. But one of your very first books, I don't think it was your first book. It might have been your second, Impossibilia. Was that your first book or your second? It was the first, it was the first you know, real book, hardback. Book. In Possibilia, yeah. there was as much non-card material as there was card material. And um, that's because I, that, was, that was my life in the 80s. And, and I, I started practicing law in the early 90s. Right. Because okay? if, you look at, if you look at the next books, uh, Smoke and Mirrors, there was considerably less non-card material. There was some, but there was less. And then after that, there was none. So. None at all. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, what, what made you want to start creating magic? So you obviously started creating magic before you practiced law, because obviously Impossibilia came out, came out before that. What right. made you decide to go, you know what, I, I, I want to start creating magic? Was it a desire? Because these days, people, um, they start creating magic. They want to release a product because they want to become magic famous. You know, you look up at the, <laughs> you know, the magicians that are, we look, we put people that create magic on pedestals and new people come into this industry and go, oh, I want to be that guy. I'm going to start creating magic. Right. I'm fairly sure that wasn't your reasoning. Uh, but what was the reason for wanting to... Well, you know, it's like, I mean, I started out doing it just because I, I was doing it. You know, I would see something or think of something and then just try to make it work for me and make certain changes and move it in certain directions that, that worked, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's the main goal. That's always been the goal was moving the ball. You know what I mean? Making magic better. And uh, when I was in D.C., 
uh, I was hanging out with, that was a great group in the, in the 80s, was the Washington DC group. Um, and uh, Larry West and his uh, cohort, uh, you know, talked to me about putting out a little booklet of my stuff, which I did called Mirage, which good luck trying to find a copy of that. And uh, um, so I guess that kind of, I have been very lucky that the things that I have come up with are things that people want to read about, okay? And Impossibilia sort of actually did quite well at the time, you know, for, you know, a book like that. And, and that from then on, you know, the brand started to create, to, to come together. And uh, so now, you know, I think people who are familiar with my stuff know where I'm at, know where my head's at and kind of know what to expect, which is all good, you know, and I'm just, I'm just grateful that I have an audience, you know, <laughs> that I can, that I can put this stuff out and, and, and people can appreciate it. So that's, uh, that's what we're at. And how did that first big book deal come about? You know, obviously you bought out Impossibilia. That was, uh, you know, quite a big deal. I mean, when Impossibilia came out, everybody was talking about it. It was the book that everybody uh, could That was l and L in their early incarnation. So it was Larry Jennings and Louis Falange's uh, brand. And, you know, the way I remember it is I sent it to him. And then a friend of mine at the time, uh, Harvey Rosenthal, right? And Larry West, well, maybe not Larry, but Harvey for sure, and and uh, and some other people who knew Lewis sort of told them how good this stuff was, or how good they thought it was. And Harvey wrote the introduction, and uh, um, and so he took it. He he went ahead and did it. And this was in the very early days of desktop publishing, right? Uh, Richard Kaufman was just hitting his stride. Uh, L and L was getting in the business, and so the book came out and was very well received, which I was happy about. And the rest is history. Now, obviously, you followed Impossibility with Smoke and Mirrors. Yeah. Did you find a bit of? I mean, Impossibility was so well received. Was there any pressure on on you worrying? Oh my gosh, you know, this has been. I've set the bar so high now is this going to do it? Because it did. But Smoke and Mirrors is my favorite book that you've ever done. And there's so much stuff in my working act that's it. You can literally, I, I said this on the channel a while ago, you could literally just take Smoke and Mirrors, learn every trick in there and have a working act and never need to learn anything else ever again. But I mean, was there a, a, a worry that, you know, you were... Yeah, I try not to put any pressure on myself at all. You know, it's like, if it's ready, it's ready. If it's not ready, it's not ready. And... um you know, when, when Impossibility came out, it was, I, you know, I had already developed, enough, you know, more material than that, obviously, because it took a while, right? And, uh, I, and when, I, when it reached critical mass, you know, I thought it was time to do another book. And it wasn't that long after, it was only maybe three years, two years, three years. And, uh, and Richard Kaufman took an interest. And so we did it. And then I graduated from law school and <laughs> then it was another 15 years before I did anything else. But, uh, um, but yeah, smoke and mirrors, I, you know, you, I don't like to compare the two, you know, which one's better. I mean, I, I like them both obviously, but, um, I think, uh, impossibility definitely got the, the ball rolling, the brand rolling, you know, absolutely. Well, let's talk, before we move on to the stuff that you brought out more recently, maybe we could speak a little bit about creativity because every magician, they have a burning desire to be creative. And one thing that you see over and over again with, with what you do and your, your, the stuff that you publish is you take such a very different creative approach to things. Yeah, you might have uh, you know, a, 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 an ace assembly that's got your own twist on it, but for mm -hmm. every routine that's, that's like that, you've also got stuff that completely is just completely out there like um no. uh the razor blade thing with, with the uh which is just great it's like how it's mutilated maybe i think how how would you come up with that and trick shop production and you know your method of doing coin in bottle with the tweezers 
revolutionized that that for me i could never do i was never happy with that and then when i saw yours i was like right that's it game changer right there and so it's like how how do you approach things from a creativity point of view you know i i look at it this way it's very important i think and it's certainly important to me to be critical of stuff is to like if you see a trick and you like it you got to know why you like it you know what's working for you and what's not working for you um and you do that enough times you get a world view of your own where you know what you think is a good trick or a, a practical trick or an effective trick all on your own and you can and you can watch something and if you can understand what what you like about it and what you don't which means you can go in and fix the part that you don't like you know what i mean mm -hmm. so so being critical is the most important thing because then you know then you have a sense of when you need to do something different right um I mean, I don't create very many things out of whole cloth, right? And I don't think anybody does. Uh, you know, magic card tricks, close-up magic, magic has been around for a long time. There's a lot of sort of fundamental, seminal kinds of tricks or ideas or concepts that are out there already, and we're all working with them. But I do put my little my own spin on a lot of different things, and sometimes I I, I add more to it than than um then i kept right and uh but the trick there is 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 first to be critical and then secondly you need to know a lot of stuff right i mean you gotta i i you know when i was earlier as a kid i read everything i still read everything it's just not as much to read anymore <laughs> and uh um and you, you you know you kind of file it away in your you know in your uh neural network right and so when you see something and you see it's not quite right the link pops right into your brain and you go well you know what if i did this perfect you know that kind of thing now this isn't exactly creativity but it's it's not exactly not either if you think about it um it's kind of like I don't know how it's it's an it's a, it's a, it's an engineering but on intuition it's like more like intuition than it is anything else and and then it works you know you try it and it works and, and that's kind of how i do most how i approach this you know my tricks are this is the trick that i like and i can tell you exactly why i like it and exactly why i did this here and not something else and not and I didn't do this over here. You know what I mean? Um, and it's I think that kind of awareness is very important for uh, for people who come, who, you know, who invent tricks in the first place. But I think for magicians generally, and I think all the really good ones have that kind of perspective, where they they look at things and they see what's what works and what doesn't and what needs to be changed and what needs to be left alone because a lot of times you just want to leave stuff the way it is you know? does that make sense it does it absolutely does so and where do you get your inspiration from though i mean from some do you do you uh, let's say that you've got do you have an idea for a plot and you you go full on into that plot or does inspiration just hit you and you go right okay or is it when you see something else or um how how does that approach work you know it's it's all of the above okay <laughs> like for example i can take i will get an idea for a trick like uh i don't know uh, an ace assembly that ends way before it's supposed to okay and now that's not exactly somebody else's trick that's just an idea and then you develop that idea, which I have. And uh, it's that idea, that whole concept of ending sooner than people expect is something that I like to do whenever I, whenever I have a chance. Um, on the other hand, I'll see a trick and I'll go, hey, that's pretty cool. But <laughs> if we did this and we did this and we did this, we can you know, make it easier to do, make it more accessible, make it more deceptive. Um, 
all of that kind of stuff. So it works both ways. It works both ways. I, I like being in the middle of it. I like seeing what's going on out there and, and, and being in the middle of it and taking it all in and seeing what moves me and what doesn't. Yeah. Does that answer your question? It does. Yeah. 100% does. Now, well, the other thing is, as an amateur, my goal here is to have fun, right? It's to enjoy my fellow magicians and do tricks for each other, as well as doing tricks for friends and family and, and strangers too, right? It's all part of the, it's all part of the same thing. It's the hobby. That's the hobby is not only coming up with new things, but hanging out with people and getting bouncing ideas off of them and doing tricks for each other and just just like i said before trying to to move the ball i think and uh a lot of stuff is also very practical though john i mean from a worker's point of view from somebody that's going out there and gigging it there's no impractical methods when you see something that you've created it's something that can be done surrounded generally. Um, it, it, a lot of the time, you don't even need a table. Um, you always talk about resetting a trick. And so even though you're not out gigging it all the time, or you're not going out and performing it professionally, yeah. you obviously are aware of the importance of that for a certain percentage of people, because like I say, your tricks are always so practical. Well, well thank you for that. Uh, I do. I mean, practicality is is one of the things that I, that I strive for, you know, there is a, there is a, I don't know what you'd call it, a myth, or there's this idea that the only thing that matters is effect, and you should just pull all the stops out and do whatever you need to do to get the effect, and I just don't agree with that at all, okay, because you can, you can pull out all the stops and have some heavy sleight of hand or some major league gaffes, and yeah, that's going to fool people badly, but you're never going to do it you're just never going to do it you know it could be the greatest trick in the world and it's going to you know you'll play with it you'll show it to your friends you'll it'll end up in your drawer where i come from is it's very important for me to want to do this trick and, and the only way i would want to do this trick is if i can do this trick you know, and it's not exactly the same thing as a skill set because, you know, I can do something. I don't um, actually I can do quite a few, but I don't. Right. Because I just soon not. And um, um, so there are trade offs involved. And, and, and one of the things that I, I think is very important is to understand that there are always trade offs. You're going to. You're going to do this move instead of that move, which means this is going to happen to the effect. But is it a big deal or not? You know, mm -hmm. and and that's where your own judgment comes in. A lot of the times is is yeah, you got to make trade offs because effect isn't everything. And anybody who thinks that it is is sort of I think they're fooling themselves because you got to get there. And getting to where you end up is a, is a is a um, it's a series of trade offs. You know, you do this instead of that. You try you. The effect becomes this instead of whatever. I know I'm being vague, but um, uh, that I that I think is sort of a very very important thing to keep in mind, sort of all the time. You know, absolutely. Um, as well as obviously the books that you. I mean, these days you know as well as me. There's like probably a hundred new magic tricks coming out every day. Like it's just crazy. But mm -hmm. back in the day, that wasn't the case. And as well as the, as well as your two books, two particular marketed routines of yours seem to dominate every magic magazine. Genie, magic. There was a full page advert in both of them for probably the best part of two years. And of course, I'm talking about Strangers Gallery and uh, Twisted Sisters. Twisted two Sisters, tricks that yeah. revolutionized the genre. I mean, they, they really did. I mean, it's still that those two routines are still in people's working repertoires all these years later. Um, I mean, two incredible routines. And as I say, they, they still sell today. You know, they're still, you go into a magic shop, I want a color changing deck. Okay, here you go, Strangers Gallery. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that everybody continues to buy, which you don't see very often these days. You don't, a trick comes out and a month later it's been forgotten, but these two 
around forever, even more so than some of the lesser known stuff you bought out, like Call of the Wild. And even though that stuff's still around, mm-hmm. and it's it's Twisted Sisters and Strangers Gallery, those two routines that have appeared timeless. Did you realize that that would be the case? Well, I, well when, when I came up with Twisted Sisters, I kind of realized I had something that good there, right? Obviously. And, uh, and I knew it for certain when, when, um, when I did it at a convention and someone who I respect a lot came up to me and tried to, to you know, gaslight me with this, uh, oh, that's an interesting use of that principle kind of thing, right? When, they, when I knew, you know, as soon as they said that, I knew they didn't have a clue. So I, I kind of very early on knew that I was that that trick was was going to be something special, and and I'm very happy about that, obviously. But um, but you know, there's there's a certain sophistication in that trick that I think is what makes it work. Okay, and that there's an equivoke that isn't really an equivoke in there, and that's why the trick works. And um, to me, that's the cool part of the whole trick. It's like it go it could go this way or this way but it don't matter because it looks the same no matter what and and, and if every trick i ever do has some kind of element like that in it then i would be very happy you know i mean that's kind of the thing I, and i say this a lot and you can see it a lot today is that anybody can take two principles or two moves and put them together and make a trick out of it i mean it's just spinning a couple wheels and massaging it a little bit but to me i want i want the trick i want one and one to be more than two and it should be three or four you know and if you don't have that kind of synergy well then maybe you ought to rethink the trick because otherwise otherwise what are we doing here you know and you and like i said the idea is to to move the ball forward so absolutely absolutely now here's here's uh, here's a question for you. You 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 released all of the you released uh, Impossibilia, Smoke and Mirrors. Uh, yeah. Everybody was talking about John Bannon. There were packet tricks coming out. You made packet tricks cool. There was all of this stuff coming out, and everybody was like performing all of your material. I couldn't at one point. I couldn't go to a gig, a magic convention, without somebody doing tattoo you. Like it was just like <laughs> that was the thing that everyone did for a long time. Yeah. Um, but then you almost disappeared from the community. It felt like you'd like vanished for, or, or you know, you, you weren't releasing stuff. You just took a break. What happened in that? It felt well, like yeah, there was a, there was a period of time in the late nineties and the early two thousands that I was like really involved in real life. You know, I had, I was, you know, my career was, was going full speed. My, you know, I had, uh, my family, I had a lot of, I had to deal with, not deal with, I was involved a lot with family type things and I just didn't have the time. And it's not that I wasn't doing stuff, it's just that I wasn't publishing stuff. I still made a, the occasional lecture tour during that period, but but not so much. And then, um, then finally, I, you know, we put it all together and, and put out Dear Mr. Fantasy, right, in, in the early 2000s. And and that was sort of like restarting the career there or re- rebooting, you know, and, uh, and that was very well received as well. So I was, I was, I was real happy to see that. Yeah. So. I mean, and then off the back of Dear Mr. Fantasy, which was an amazing book. And as you said, all card magic off the back of that, you, your name became synonymous with big blind media. Um, and you've done so much with those guys. Uh, in these days, there's so many magic producers, and you see people flitting from one to another. Oh, okay, this guy's now got something with Penguin, now he's got something with Murphy's, now he's got... You seem to be, like, exclusive to Big Blind Media, which isn't a bad thing, because Owen is amazing. And He's amazing. He is absolutely amazing. I'll tell you the story. You know, when magic videos first came out, back in um, the 80s, right? There was uh, Stevens, there was uh, Tannen Stars of Magic, and then there was A1 Multimedia, right? And when they came out, I was like the second guy to do a video for A1 Multimedia, 
you know, J.C. Wagner was the first and then I was the second. So I, I won't say I was a pioneer, but let's just say I was there in the early days. Um, and then, and then, and I don't mean this pejoratively in any way, but L and L kind of took over that space, mm -hmm. and they had their format with the backdrop and the and the studio audience and and all that. And every single one of their videos looked the same, just different people and different tricks, right? And um, which is fine. I mean, there's some great stuff on there, and they certainly they certainly put a lot of things into the into the marketplace that deserved to be there. But this just wasn't the kind of thing I wanted to do, right? So I didn't do any video. And then um, Big Blind Media did a video uh, with Josh J. Okay, I don't know whether you remember, it was kind of a half lecture, half style kind of video. And, and I saw that and I go, oh, wow, you know what? If I'm gonna do a video, that's the kind of video I wanna do. And then, it was, it was amazing, sort of as if he heard me, I get this email out of the blue from Owen asking if I would be interested in doing anything with them. And I just sort of jumped at the chance. And, you know, everything went so well. Uh, we get along so well. He has these creative ideas that made it, that made these videos look different. I mean, it's still teaching videos, right? But why not have a little fun at the same time? And, and he's sort of a master at that in terms of style. And it went so well that I didn't really see any good reason not to do videos with him. You know, it's not like I'm dying to do my next video. It's just when the time is right, you know, he's the guy I'm going to look at first. You know, now I am guilty of doing some penguin stuff, but that's okay. You know, I mean, the Penguin stuff was different. It was more retrospective. It was more, you know, covering, you know, the, the last 20 years as opposed to putting forth new stuff. Um, and, it, and Penguin is great to work with. I mean, those guys are fabulous. And, and uh, um, but Owen is my guy. You know, if I do a video, it's most likely going to, it's, if it's not with him, it's for reasons. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? He, he really cares. He really does, you know, and his yeah. production quality is just second to none. No, uh, second to none. Second. And you can tell by all the copycats that are out there. I mean, now everybody who's doing videos are kind of sort of trying to do, trying to be him. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And you put a lot of stuff out with Big Blind Media. Um, mm -hmm. Just for new people to this channel that haven't really studied your career, could you define fractal card magic for me? Because that's a <laughs> term that you coined. This is a thing that's now a thing, and you're the one that basically came up with it. Yeah, it's a thing. Um, but I, okay, fractal card magic is magic that car, uh, packet tricks that end clean. Okay, I mean it's that simple, right? Fractal was was applying was just sort of trying to trademark that concept of, of a packet trick that did all the packet trick things, but ended clean. And I, you know, to talk about other sort of opinions in the marketplace, there are people out there who say, oh, it doesn't have to end clean. It's just a matter of audience management. You know, um, people don't really want to see, uh, you know, if you do it right, you know, there's no heat on it, that kind of thing. That's just, that's just not true, in my opinion, okay? Audience management means you do the trick and then you put it in your pocket because people really do want to see the cards. They just do because, you know, that's part of the fun of a packet trick. You've got like five cards. It's not a deck of cards. It's not something you're going to, you know, use to play a game with. It's five cards and you're going to do a thing and you do it and it looks great. Well, why wouldn't they want to see those cards? Yeah. Um, now, I have tricks that don't end examinable, right? Uh, you mentioned Call of the Wild, which is, which is a pretty good trick. Um, but, but even in there, I tried to shift the heat onto the examinable part, yeah. right? And, and, and so that was sort of an early, early thinking of, of all of this. And, 
So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with tricks that aren't examinable. It's just they're not examinable. And that's a limitation that you're going to have to live with, or at least, at least, um, yeah, it's a limitation you're going to have to deal with. And me, I'd rather deal with it in the engineering phase so that I can end clean. And, and the, the, other, the other thing is, and not to get too preachy about this, but people's attitudes change. If you're doing a trick that you're bulletproof in, your attitude is going to be different. And so if you're doing a packet trick that if they grab the cards out of their hand, your hands, you're not going to find anything. Your attitude changes, right? When you end the trick and you toss the cards on the table, you're going to toss them a little farther than you otherwise would. Because why? Because you can, right? And so, so the whole attitude and, and, and feeling of the trick, I think, change. And, I, I, and that's not a bad thing, obviously. So that's why, uh, that's why when I'm doing this stuff, and I still do it, is I, I do come to things with, with, with the view of ending the trick uh, examinable. Not enough to start examinable. In fact, a lot of my things don't. Mm -hmm but they do have to end examinable. And, and, and that's, that's just where my head is at. And, and people, people can disagree. I mean, I'm not at all saying that you should only do examinable packet tricks. Um, all I'm saying is, is that they are different and they should be appreciated for that. And if, you know, if people don't feel the same way, that's fine with me too. You know? I mean, you've made packet tricks cool. <laughs> you, you have. I mean, there's people out there that go, oh, I don't do packet tricks. I don't like packet tricks. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to do packet tricks. But I mean, I, I think of some of the packet tricks that you've brought out over the years, and they're just incredible. It's, it's they're just, you know, they, they work really well. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, the thing, the other little saying that, that you, you hear is that, you know, you shouldn't do packet tricks unless you can pretend to take them out of a deck and, and do them, you know. And I don't agree with that at all. I mean, in fact, I think it's, a, it's <laughs> this is going to be a little controversial. It's probably better if you don't, okay? Because here's why. Um, there is a saying, and it's probably true, that if you do card tricks for people, the next day, they will remember, oh yeah, he did card tricks and they were pretty good, but that's it, right? So how do you, how do you get more of this to stick with people? And packet tricks are a good way to do it. Why? Because they're not card tricks. Like I said, it's five cards. You're not going to play cards with them. You're not going to tell anybody's fortune. You're not going to do things that people associate with cards with this packet trick. You're gonna do a magic trick and it's gonna stand out like that. It differentiates itself from the trick that came before and the trick that came after. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps, that helps people the next day kind of remember things a little better, which, which is a good thing, you know? And one other thing I wanna to talk to you about with regards to um, a lot of the things that you've been putting out recently, you, you, you've brought out the Move Zero trilogy, I think it is now, or probably four or five volumes, it seems to, yeah, it goes on forever, which is amazing. Um, which is obviously a concept of, I don't wanna say self-working magic, but magic that doesn't really have many moves in it, obviously. But this is something that you've been doing from back in the day. I mean, obviously you think about routines like directed verdict and things like that you you've never strayed away from even though you you're you know you know a lot when it comes to sleight of hand you know a lot but you're not afraid to put together a really well constructed timely departure I can keep thinking of millions of them self-working trick that doesn't but a lot of magicians again I hear it because I, I see the comments on my my channel thousands of comments I do do self-working magic because it's boring and, and you know, you, it's, it's not any good unless it's got a move in it. You're capable of doing all the moves, but you've published some amazing routines throughout your entire career that are completely moveless and slight free. Can I get you, can I get your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, let's see where, where to begin. Uh, we talked earlier about trade-offs and I always, 
I always like to not make things difficult for myself, right? And and at the at the end of that spectrum are self self working tricks. And I use the term self working, even though a lot of people think that it's um, not a good term, but they're wrong because you know what? It's a term of art, all right? It's something that we use in our magic discussions. We know what it means. So the fact that it's self-working instead of slight light or instead of, you know, whatever is really meaningless, okay? Because you use the term, you know what it means. Okay, so self-working. I, there's a certain charm, I think, to self-working card tricks because it's all about the engineering now. Now, when I was coming up, self-working card tricks were slightly pejorative and because for a couple of reasons, most of them either required a complete, a full deck stack, or they weren't very good, okay? I mean, that's kind of what, what you were looking at, and, and, and that doesn't need to be the case, you know? It's, it's just a question of, you know, putting things in a, cer in a certain direction, I guess. And now, now in, uh, into the world of Zoom, you know, this whole notion of tricks that you can do virtually uh, has kind of taken off and it's the same kind of thing. Now, to be honest, a lot of the Zoom tricks that you see are tricks that you are doing them only because you have to do them virtually. <laughs> They're not necessarily tricks you would pick if you were doing, if you were doing it live, right? Um, but there are some that you would. And, and, and I, when I think about doing things virtually, I, I want to be able to do that trick live as well, okay? And I want it to have the same effect if they're sitting across the table or sitting halfway across the world, okay? And um, so, so the fact that I, the fact that I've spent a lot of time thinking about self-working magic helps, helps in that regard, you know? Um, but the move zero thing is really no sleight of hand whatsoever. I mean, that was the goal. And the other goal, the, the other thing about that series is people kept being surprised that the, that the second one was as good or better than the first one. And the third one was as good or better than the first two. And the fourth, you know, thing was, we planned it that way. I sat down and we planned out four volumes. Okay. And so we were able to make every one as good as it could get. It wasn't a question of, of doing your best tricks on volume one and then your second best tricks on volume two. And then like that, it was all planned out and it was, you know, in that order for a reason. And uh, I think it came out great myself. And I was very pleased with how the project turned out. And, um, but that being said, it is, and it was meant to be, not necessarily an endorsement of only doing self-working card tricks, but a clear uh, examination of how self-working card tricks could be effective, could be more effective than most people think. And, and, and in many cases, be really very effective. And in fact, some of the best tricks I do now are probably self-working card tricks, you know? And that again, that again, you know, it's just, a, it's a matter of taste and it's a matter of trade off and it's a matter of um, appreciating sort of various aspects of stuff. Anyway, long story, long answer. No, it's a great answer. Fantastic. <laughs> here's, a, here's a question for you. You talked hmm. about how um, Dear Mr. Fantasy was the kind of the relaunch of the John Bannon brand. Um, which has continued throughout everything that you've done with Big Blind, Me uh, Big Blind Media. Right. Obviously, before that, you had the output in the 80s um, that, that was uh, amazing as well. Would you say that the stuff that you're bringing out now is better than or on the same level as? Uh, oh, that's a great question. And I have thought about it. You know, I go back and I look at the early stuff and I look at, what I say about the early stuff, because I've always kind of been a little chatty of a of a of an author, and my worldview has been completely consistent. 
over the over the 35 year period okay so the way i'm thinking about things remains the same and so i i think it is a journey i think there is a it's a continuous thing um and 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 the later stuff is different from the first stuff in the way that card magic has is different now than it was 30 years ago you know what i mean and but the important thing for me or the thing that i find the most gratifying is that my in print my like i said worldview is consistent all the way across i'm i'm always trying to achieve the same things and 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 in this in in the same ways and um so that's kind of cool for me to look back 30 years and, and go oh yeah okay good i did say that <laughs> but but anyway does that answer your question yeah no absolutely okay. definitely it does so here's is, is it this is i think this is probably going to be impossible for you to ask but i'm gonna i'm gonna ask it anyway i don't think you're gonna be able to answer this if you had to pick one routine out of everything you've ever published <laughs> That you'd say, okay, that's that's the one. If that that's that's the thing that defines me as a creator, is that is there is there a favorite or? You're right. That is first of all, it's not a fair question to ask. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> okay, and then and secondly, you know, I'm always very very partial to the trick I'm working on at present. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's the, it's the tyranny of the new. It's like. You know, because I'm I'm always puttering with some idea or some trick or whatever, and that's where my attention is, and that's what I'm most partial to. There are a handful of tricks um, over the years that that I particularly uh, um, that I'm particularly fond of, okay, or I, I I they that I like to do more often, or I have done more often, and. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to tip that, you know. <laughs> that's fair enough. That's fair so, enough. No, that's cool. Um, but yeah, for me, for me, a lot of the fun, well, it, it's certainly fun to do the old tricks, right? Because I, if I publish them, I did for a reason that I still like, okay? Um, but it's also fun for me to do the new tricks because that's, that's what I do. That's that for me. That's the hobby, right? Absolutely. So, and yeah. here's a question: You, you, of, I mean, it's obvious to anyone who speaks to you and sees the material you publish. You love magic. Um, I see stuff coming out from you all the time, not just published through Big Blind Media, but I was reading Genie the other week, and uh, you had your version of Brother John Hammond's uh, Lucky Cards, and I was like, that's amazing, that's brilliant, I've started doing it, and it's like, I, I, I see you, your, your output is just everywhere, <laughs> like all over the place, so you're obviously always creating and, 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 you know, refining and going back on plots and so on and so forth. Over the last year and a half, I've spoken to a lot of magicians and they've, I've, they've said to me, I, I can't even be bothered to pick up a pack of cards. I, I, I've lost yeah. my will to do that because of everything that's going on in the world. It, it's been mm -hmm. difficult for me to even practice, let alone as somebody who, I, I don't know if you've suffered through that yourself. It doesn't seem like you have because your output's been consistent. Uh, is, is there any advice that you can give people on how to maintain that excitement and love of, of of creating and performing and 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 yeah yeah i mean obviously i can give you my two cents worth for me i i have been involved in a session a group of guys that get together on saturdays every saturday for the last 30 years okay well this was um you know the my dear departed friend Simon Aronson, Dave Solomon. Uh, there's a new guy, uh, David Finkelstein, who's been in for probably ten or ten or more years. Uh, recently, you know, people like John Rockerbomber are becoming regulars to the thing. But the idea that it happens every Saturday is is liberating. Okay. Because there's enough people there where you don't really have to bring something every week. Okay. There will always be something to discuss, whether you brought it or whether somebody else did. 
And that, that way you keep your hand in without feeling this urge to continually be doing something. And in my sort of career here, this has been invaluable to me. It's what's kept me in magic during periods of which maybe I wouldn't be doing as much. Um, just having that regularity of, of um, uh, kindred spirits, people who think the same way and, uh, and like each other. Okay, so that would be my recommendation to sort of stay involved. And with Zoom, even now with Zoom, I have a Saturday group, I have a Friday group, you know, I have an every other Monday group. And uh, um, I look forward to those. They're all, they're all fun, fun to do. Well, would you, you mentioned that way back in the day, you made the decision to um, move away from anything else other than card magic, because that's what you love and that's what you're passionate about. Right. But as somebody who actively performs many John Bannon routines that are not card magic and <laughs> loves a lot of the output, that you, we spoke about it off camera before we started filming, you know, there's some great stuff that you've done. Have you ever kind of sat down and thought, you've seen a half dollar sitting on the table and you go, you know what? Let me just revisit that. You know, it's it's funny. It's funny that you should mention that. Over the last year and a half, pandemic-wise, you know, got a lot of time on my hands. And I have retired from the practice of law, right? So now I'm a, one of the voluntarily unemployed people, and I have time on my hands. And so, yeah, card tricks aren't really filling up every spare minute of my day because I have a lot of spare minutes, you know, and not all of them. I can't you spend all of them watching Netflix, right? So... I, uh, I, I have been thinking about coin tricks again, um, even though right now, today, today, I could not classic palm a coin to save my life, okay? Um, but that being said, it is interesting to think about how can you do really good card tricks without doing many, if any, moves at all. And it is possible. Uh, and you know that you're a coin guy. So, you know, with the right gas, you know, you don't have to do anything hardly, you know? And so that's kind of where my head is at right now is, is I don't want to say self-working coin magic because, because that is absolutely not true, right? You, you're going to have to do something secret, which makes it a slight, which makes it not self-working. Okay. Um, but still, there can be, there are tricks that, you know, you just do the right thing in the right order and they work, you know? So, but yeah, I have been thinking about that. And that, that's largely a function, I guess, of having more time on my hands than, than I used to. Well, I don't buy anything that you've bought out, that, okay. you know, well, anything, period. But I mean, if you ever bought out another project that had something to do with something other than cards, that'd be very exciting. I'd love to see that. <laughs> well, you know, recently, at least last several years, I have been playing around with mentalism more than, you know, but it's generally been mentalism with cards, you know, so, but not exclusively. So, I, so there are, there are some things like that, but now I actually have been thinking about coin magic, where it'll go. I don't know. I'll amuse myself. Okay. At well, least. You know, that brings me to my, uh, my, my next question, which is uh, obviously We've talked about this, uh, Impossibilia, Smoke and Mirrors, Dear Mr. Fantasy. You've bought out pamphlets since then. I just reviewed Lucky very recently, and Lucky. You, you've bought out some smaller books. Yeah, those were all rolled into uh, High Caliber. Mm. Okay, so High Caliber is basically a collection of those small books over, I guess it was about a 10-year period of time. So I love the small books. Love, 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 because they're, they're smaller, bite-sized projects that you can put together and not be totally overwhelmed with, like a big book would be, you know? Would you, would you ever go down the route of another big book again, or, or is your, uh, you know, <laughs> or is your focus on other, other styles of projects? Okay, well, I have this genie column, right? Mm -hmm. So when I finish that, there's a big book right there. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Because one of the things I did learn, I have learned in this process is not, not everybody reads Gene. Okay. And, and, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. I, I didn't put any filler in there. And so I think when I roll it all together into a big book, it will be, a, it will be a pretty decent book. Um, so there's that. And then I am accumulating, um, tricks that I've come up with that eventually will reach a critical mass and will eventually probably not, not too much uh, later than now, reach a critical mass and it, and it will be a new hardback, hardback book project. Wow. Okay, so, and I'm kind of excited about that. So, yeah. cause there's some cool stuff in there that no one's, no one's seen except my, my people, so. Wow. Do we do we have? I know this is going to get asked in the comments, so I'm going to ask it. Do mm. we have a time frame on that? Are we talking months, um, years? Are we okay. talking multiple years? In a perfect world, it would be at some convention next year. We would really we would release it uh, probably towards the end of the year. So maybe Magic Live next year, or or Blackpool the following year. Who knows? Um, but that's that's it. I mean, it's not it's not imminent, but it's not far. It's not far. So, that's and I'm excited about it. I really am. I think there's some cool stuff in there. And have you got a name for the book already? <laughs> I have a working title, which which I want to mirrors two of the best names of books that I've ever heard. <laughs> well, you know, people who know my stuff know that I'm not afraid of obscure titles, mm -hmm. right? So there will be an appropriately obscure title to the book. Cool, cool, lovely. I, I don't want to. Yeah, I made the mistake a long time ago of of advance in advance calling my next book Cardzilla, which is a great title, and I still intend to do it. It, but then it kind of took on a life of its own, and I don't want I don't want that to happen again. Cardzilla will probably be a, a, a collection and a retrospective now um but i'm not nearly ready to put that together yet so mm -hmm. well i have two other questions for you before we wrap this okay. up but the first question okay. is do you have any advice for somebody who's watching this that wants to to uh, we've, we've talked about creativity but i'm talking about releasing magic because you've been releasing magic from way back in the day you've worked with so many different companies uh you know you talked about a1 multimedia you've worked with over the years, so many different companies producing so many different projects. You've self-published some stuff as well. Is, is there any advice that you can give somebody who wants to make a name for themselves? They've got a trick. It's not about the trick. They feel it's ready. They've worked it in. They feel it adds to the genre of whatever it is. How do they get their name out there? How do they get on a producer's radar? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. And it's a tough one. I mean, you mentioned before about there being like a hundred new tricks every week, right? And and I think that's because of two things. One is because of the internet, right? And because of the internet, we have a, a globalization of magic. Like when I was starting out, there were Americans who wrote stuff in English and there were British people who wrote stuff in English and there may have been French or Spanish, but we never heard of them, you know? And then, then, I would say in the 90s and the, in the early 2000s, we started hearing about the Spanish magicians and we started hearing about French magicians, right? And then, um, but now it doesn't matter where you are in the world. It does not matter because you're gonna put a video up on YouTube and, 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 and show us your stuff, right? Or, or you're going to, the, the, the language barrier goes away because it's, more, it's moving more towards video and downloads than it is print. And uh, so that barrier is not there anymore, you know. Um, I'm a print guy. I like books, but I can see and I appreciate how hard they are to write. I mean, it's not I mean, it's something you really have to want to do, <laughs> you know. Um, but now with video, you know, everybody can put stuff out. Now, what that does, in my opinion, is it lowers the bar so much which is why there's a hundred tricks. I mean, in the old days, somebody else had to decide whether to publish your thing or not. Okay, so that, that, that at least is a hurdle you had to cross. Nowadays, it's not so much, 
and and with um, the churn that I call it, and if you know magic shops now, the half life of a new trick is is a matter of days, you know, before before they move on to something else. And so because of that that churn, there's always a demand, and therefore the expectation of my expectation of quality at least has gone down. Okay, so it's a it's a tough market out there. Um, it's one that I would not have to want to break into right now. I am lucky enough, fortunate enough that over the years I have a brand, okay, which which helps a lot. But if I didn't have one, um, my advice would be make sure that what you're doing, that's the right way to put this. I run across tricks that are really good, but there are tricks that I call only, tricks that only their mother could love right? Mm -hmm. Which means it's a great trick and you do it great and, and it's fun to watch, but nobody else on the planet is going to do it except you, okay? And people need to have an appreciation for those kinds of tricks because if you go out in the market with one of those, I don't know that you're going to do all that well. Mm -hmm. I mean, you need to have, you need to either be at least consistent with your, with your audience or have an appreciation of who your audience is likely to be uh, in terms of in, in, in terms of commercial purchasers, right? Um, and if you don't, you're not gonna, it, it, nothing's gonna work, right? Because the whole idea here is, is, is to, there are, I'm gonna say develop a brand and, and it's probably not as concrete as that. But it's the, what you don't want to do is develop what I would call an anti-brand, okay? And there are people I, I've seen out there already that when I see who it is, I know I'm not interested. And I don't care what it is because, because it's like I've seen enough to know kind of what to expect and I'm ready to move on. And so the important thing is not to become an anti-brand. Mm. And, and other than that, just, you know, keep plugging. And how do you make sure that you don't become an anti-brand? Because I've never heard of that that term before, but that is so true. I can think of like a, I've never thought of it that way before. That, but, but how would you make sure that, as a creator, you're not you're not going down that route? Well, it takes a lot of self-awareness, right? We are all somewhat guilty of drinking our own Kool Aid, right? But you need to be aware that that's what you're doing. My, I think the best way to do it is to have a cadre of, uh, of uh, comrades who, would, who are willing to tell you the truth, right? Or at least suggest, make certain suggestions that might help you avoid that trap. Um, that's probably the single best thing to do. One is not to take yourself too seriously. And the second one is hang around a bunch of people who definitely don't take you that seriously, <laughs> that, that seriously. So, and that will help you, I think, avoid that trap. And other than that, you know, luck plays a part in it too. You know, you may think you came up with, and I do from time to time, come up with the greatest thing in magic in a long time and and you may be right you may be wrong you're probably wrong but you but it may be good enough for enough people that it's worth doing you know um so anyway but that's all part of the fun i mean if, if you're if you're if if someone is trying to do this in order to make a huge name for themselves fast i have no advice because it's not going to happen it's just not going to happen and and if you're not doing it for the fun of it then you probably aren't gonna be that lucky yet. You know what I mean? Most people. Was that was that, was that preachy enough? No, that was amazing. Am I old enough to be able to say shit like that? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so my final question. Okay. What's next? And what I mean by that, I mean we've talked about books and projects and stuff like that, but let's be honest, John. Your legacy is set and then some. I mean. I mentioned it at the beginning. I'm fairly sure you've probably forgotten some tricks. I mean, how you can produce, but maybe I'm wrong, but I mean, I've created tricks in the past that I've forgotten and I'm nowhere nearly as prolific as you. You've, you've, you've set the bar so high. You've produced so many tricks and routines that have 
literally change the game. And I don't just say that to butter you up. I, that, that's not my style. Genuinely, there's mm -hmm. many things that you've brought out that have literally changed the game in that particular genre. Um, and, and you've done it over and over and over again. And then you reinvent yourself and you do it over and over again. If you decided to walk away tomorrow and go, that's it, you know what? I'm never going to produce anything again. People would still be recommending and talking about John Bonham products long after I'm dead. Like, so is, is there anything left on your magical bucket list that you want to do that you haven't done yet? Anything, <laughs> you, 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 any goals that you've got in place? Or have you kind of, you know, I'm looking at the wall behind you, John. I mean, you've done a lot and then some, and that's not even a quarter of yeah. what you've achieved. You've been on front covers of magazines. You've produced so much amazing material. Is there anything left? Is there any, anything on the bucket list? <sighs> well, first of all, thank you for saying all of that. Um, and secondly, like I, do, like I said, I do feel fortunate that people, you know, have res the reception to my material has been as, as, as good as it has been. I just do what I do, you know, and I've always just done what I do. And, and I, I'm, I am, you know, gratified and, and I'm happy that people like some or all or some or some of the stuff that I do. And so that's what I'm going to, you know, I've been, I'm going to be on the cover of Genie magazine at some point. You should be. I mean, you've wrote then that magazine for so long now. That's what I was, that's what I was going to say. So, so that's a goal of mine, but other, um, but you know, I don't have, I'm not going to win a FISM prize. I'm not going to go perform at the magic castle. You know, I, I, I do what I do. And, uh, and, uh, and with any luck, people will continue to, to like what I do. So I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. Well, please don't. On behalf of the magic community, please don't stop ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you. It's, no, it's, it's, it's amazing. John, uh, like I said to you at the beginning of this interview, you're somebody that I've been wanting to interview for a long time because you are, and I've said it on this channel over and over again, you are a personal hero of mine. My, a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the material that I, I perform on a regular basis is, is your material. And I rave about it from the rooftops over and over again. So I, it's really, oh, thank it, you. it's great that you've, you've found the time to come on the channel. So thank you so much. Well, thanks for asking me. I, I had a good time and hopefully this will work out for you. And um Craig, we should talk again sometime. I'd just, love to. I'd love to. Know. That just would be amazing. Look out, for the, look out for interview part two at some point in the future. There you go. Or maybe I'll see you at Blackpool next year. That would be amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd love to see you back at Blackpool. Have you, you've lectured Blackpool, haven't you? Have you, have you? I have twice. I have twice. Uh, but, you know, over the last 10 years, it's been twice. And uh, it's always a trip. And... Uh, now I am talking to a lot of my comrades and trying to get, and I'm getting them to go to Blackpool because everybody should go to Blackpool at least once, you know. Unless you've experienced Blackpool, it's impossible to know exactly. It's impossible to know. I agree with you completely. So, so yeah, I hope to see you back at Blackpool. And if Russ Stevens and Russ Brown are watching this, who organize Blackpool Magic Convention, and I know they do, Book John Bannon again, please, for next year. That would be absolutely. <laughs> uh, I may be there anyway, but that would all that would be. Uh, I certainly would be willing to entertain that for sure, as long as I don't have to do the horseshoe. That is a condition. That I mean, I've done it. <laughs> I have too. <laughs> Once. It's it it really does. Uh, it's not the easiest thing in the world. I remember seeing many many years ago. I mean, another person who I respect so much is the late great. Um, uh, uh, the late great uh, David Roth and and I remember going to the Horseshoe once and David Roth was sandwiched in between Jay Sankey and Greg Wilson and it was just like you haven't got a chance David it's just yeah in my luck I was followed by uh, by David Williamson right man <laughs> that's tough so uh, yeah you know the funny thing I don't know whether this is going to make it, but the funny thing about the horseshoe is that everybody backstage knows how horrible it is for the performer and everybody's sort of making fun of it and they're patting you on the back saying, don't worry, it'll be over soon and all of that kind of stuff, which is so absolutely true, but it's just the, that kind of self-awareness has always amused me. But. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's another place in the world that has that same sort of performing environment as, no. uh, as the horseshoe. I know, I know. 
Yeah. Very good. Right, Craig. John, thank you so much. Guys, leave a comment down below. I'm sure John will see it. Uh, me and Ryland have just filmed a review show special on all of John's material. So look out for that as well. That'll be hitting the channel soon. Um, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment. I'll be back tomorrow. But one more time, John, thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Craig. Happy to be here.